Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The glorious era that was Tudor England helped shape the early exploration and colonization of the North American continent. Join me as we continue a deep dive into Tudor England and its great transatlantic explorers. Before England ruled the waves, there was the Mary Rose, a technologically advanced sailing vessel that contributed to the future global domination of the English Navy, including the vast waters surrounding the North American continent. The Mary Rose is a Carrick-type warship of the Tudor Navy of King Henry VIII. She served for 33 years in several wars against France, Scotland, and Brittany. Built in 1511, King Henry's favorite warship was lost during a naval battle over 400 years ago. She led the 1545 attack on the galleys of a French invasion fleet, but sank in the Solent, the strait north of the Isle of Wight, near South England's coast. While she lay on the seabed, the wreck of the Mary Rose and its contents were preserved in silt for centuries and located in 1971 and raised in 1982 in one of the most complex and expensive maritime salvage projects in history. The surviving section of the ship and thousands of recovered artifacts are of great value as a Tudor period time capsule that sheds light on the daily lives of typical Tudor era sailors that cross the ocean to the shores of North America and the advanced technology of the transatlantic ships they sailed. Maritime archaeologists are still uncovering its secrets today. Many of the artifacts are unique to the Mary Rose and have provided insights into topics ranging from naval warfare to the history of musical instruments. Susan Hume of the Witness podcast takes us back four decades to the excavation of the Mary Rose. I'm taking you back to October 1982, when 60 million people worldwide watched an extraordinary feat on live television. The raising of the 400-year-old wreck of a Tudor warship, the Mary Rose, from the seabed off the south coast of England. Henry VIII's naval commander had called it the flower of all ships that ever sailed. The Mary Rose had been in service for nearly 35 years, when in July 1545, a vast French armada massed just off Portsmouth Harbour and engaged in battle with the English fleet. No one quite knows why, but near the end of the second day, the Mary Rose suddenly foundered and sank after making a sharp turn. King Henry VIII is said to have been able to hear the cries of the drowning sailors as he watched in horror from South Sea Castle. Such was the value of the ship that Henry VIII brought experts from Venice to try to salvage it, but to no avail. And so, for centuries, the Mary Rose lay on the seabed, invisible, half of it eaten away by shipworms, the rest buried under six feet of mud. Then, in 1965, it was rediscovered and investigations began. The project was led by archaeologist Margaret Rule. By the end of 1978, we'd shown that enough of the ship was there, deeply buried in the mud, to make it worthwhile excavating her completely, emptying the ship, and then bringing the empty hull to the surface to become the centrepiece of a museum. I think there's a sort of romance about something that was once lost and is now found, but also the sheer bonkers scale of it. I mean, to raise a ship of that size from the bottom of the sea... Christopher Dobbs. I just happened to be one of the few archaeologists who also had diving qualifications. So I went straight from university into a dream job of excavating the Mary Rose. And it was just so exciting. I mean, absolutely amazing. Digging with spades, the divers uncovered not just timbers, but sea chests full of precious Tudor objects. There were shoes, a backgammon set, carpenter's tools, cannons, longbows, and the skeletons of the drowned sailors, and even of the ship's rats. But their view of the wreck wasn't much like the pictures in children's books or in Pirates of the Caribbean, because the divers couldn't really see the Mary Rose at all. The visibility in the Solent is really murky. You can hardly see a thing. And also, the whole ship was still covered in mud. We just had a few excavation trenches where you might see a small bit of timber or some of the objects. 
At this point, we're about two metres below the seabed at present and about three and a half metres below the original seabed. All this timber is so well preserved because it's been protected by this inert silt, a sort of clay, which rapidly collected when the ship first sank and prevented biological and mechanical erosion of the timbers. After the huge hull was emptied of mud and objects came the final phase, bringing it to the surface once again. It was a major feat of engineering. First we had to raise it up just above the seabed with jacks, very, very slowly. Then we had to transfer it from where it had been, using a a lifting frame, to put it into a cradle, so that for the final lifting... It was just the raising of it into the air, supported both from below in a cradle and from above with a frame. 570 tonnes of waterlogged Tudor timber was finally raised from the sea over two days in October 1982. A massive crane named Tog Moore had been towed down from the North Sea oil fields to carry out the final lift. And lots of people had come to watch. I think it was on that day, that Sunday, when we woke up and saw this flotilla of yachts and small craft and ferries that had been chartered all moored up around us. We realised what an enormous event this was. Were you confident that it would work? My main bit of confidence was a few days earlier when we'd finished the lifting of the first few inches and I went down to inspect the hull and to film it and I put my hand on the hull and I was on the seabed and I could just feel the whole hull just very, very gently swaying. And that's when certainly I, in my mind, thought, this is amazing. The hull is in one piece. It's all intact. We're going to be able to raise it. Eventually, the dark timber shimmered just beneath the greenish surface. And then it was up. There is the wreck of the Mary Rose. It has come to the surface. A wonderful moment. You hear all the sirens ringing, and I should think probably the Navy will get in on the act. It has. has the, gun, the gun has gone off at South Sea. Queue. This historic moment as the Mary Rose comes to the surface. She's been on the seabed for 437 years. She is seeing air and daylight for the first time since that day on July the 19th when she sank to the bottom with a loss of all hands. But Christopher Dobbs missed the razzmatazz of gun salutes and champagne because he was still working underwater. And then by the time I did come out of the water, we had a a few problems with a little slip and crash. Well, I'm still in dive control with Lord Malmesbury, the senior vice president of the Trust, and Christopher Dobbs, who's just finished his working stint on the side. Chris, what were you up to? I was making sure there was enough air in the bags to support the hull when the whole weight finally rested on it. It's very hard work, but most of it's done now. Well, I can see through the window of dive control that the vessel is now rising in the water. The massive crane of Togmore is lifting the vessel further. Colonel Tilly, what's happened there? It would look as though the leg on the right, something has given there, and the superstructure has dropped down a certain distance. Nothing irrevocable. The Army Royal Engineer Colonel Chitty there, trying to maintain a stiff upper lip as one leg of the lifting structure gave way. We were just completely stunned. That There was just a silence. Nobody knew what to say at all. It was extremely worrying. But once it was worked out what had happened, it didn't feel so bad. And jokingly, later we were congratulated for making it seem more exciting because until that moment it had been like watching paint dry. So many people had taken a day off school or a day off work or had pulled a sickie or something so that they could watch the Mary Rose coming up. And so perhaps it was good because we didn't disappoint. Luckily, the Mary Rose was not herself damaged and a few hours later she was towed into Portsmouth Harbour. People with torches had lined the dock to greet her. That's the moment when we thought we've done it. And there was a very, very large marquee on the common at Southsea Common near Southsea Castle. And there was a pretty big party. We had a good party that night. The Mary Rose is now displayed in a purpose-built museum at Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, alongside some of the thousands of sailors' tools, weapons and personal possessions found with her. Even more important to me than the ship is that you can get a feel for the sailors. You can see the holes in someone's shoe. You can see their peppercorns, their shoelaces. Every aspect of Tudor life is in that museum. It's intensely personal. It's not about a ship. 
It's about people who lived and sadly died almost 500 years ago. Christopher Dobbs is head of maritime archaeology at the Mary Rose Trust and still dives at the wreck site. Although the Mary Rose never reached North American shores, its importance to later English naval expeditions to the New World was significant. Technological advancements that were important to the age of exploration were the adoption of the magnetic compass and advances in ship design. Ships grew in size, required smaller crews, and were able to sail longer distances without stopping. This led to significant lower long-distance shipping costs. Prior to the age of exploration, European sailing had been primarily close to land, guided by port and coastal nautical charts. These sea atlases specified proven ocean routes guided by coastal landmarks as sailors departed from a known point, followed a compass heading, and tried to identify their location by its landmarks. For the first oceanic exploration, Western Europeans used the compass, as well as progressive new advances in cartography and astronomy. Arab navigational tools like the Astrolab and Quadrant were used for celestial navigation using astronomical charts plotting the location of the stars over a distinct period of time. These tables revolutionized navigation, allowing the calculation of latitude. Exact longitude, however, remained elusive, and mariners struggled to determine it for centuries. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.